If you had a conspiracy, what animal would you name it after? Ooh, I got to say zebra is good, but there's a zebra murders. Mm. Um, uh, catfish. I feel like a good name for like some bullshit like uh, thing would be like the cat the catfish conspiracy. Mm. Also, I'd probably be pretty rocking at catfishing in general, like the act of it. Okay. Um, oh, wait, or, the act of it? Okay, I got it. Yes. Or like the – what's the – the – the ass conspiracy, like the mule conspiracy. The, the ass conspiracy? <laughs> the ass conspiracy. I feel like that would the, be, the, the ass, reason that that would files. be a good one is because it would confuse people right off the bat. The ass conspiracy. And people would be like, what is it about? It's like, no, it's, it has to do with just like these mountainous roads that, yeah. but yeah, the ass, what about you? Um, I don't know. Good question. I love that I threw that out there and I didn't know yeah, no, an answer. That's, a, that's the I classic, no the answer. interviewer's gambit. I'm gonna do the capybara. The the that is what you would do. The capybara conspiracy. What about you? They're so cute. Probably go with sloth. Sloth mm. conspiracy. It's, an it's a, and a deadly sin. Sort yeah. of a slow slow burn that yeah. one. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode one of the ass conspiracy. <laughs> Just playing. Welcome to episode who knows of True Anon. Of whatever. Of whatever. <laughs> yeah, welcome to who knows episode who knows of whatever. My name is a Who Gives name. a Shit. <laughs> yeah, I'm Shut the Fuck Up. And we're, of course, joined by a producer. Tell me next time. What is on second? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know. Third base. Just <laughs> kidding. It's True Anon. I'm Liz. That's Brace. Young Chomsky, you know the drill. You know the motherfucking drill. Uh, it's part two of our interview. About, I almost just made a joke, but the octopus and the now out on streaming, available wherever streaming is sold, mm-hmm. but exclusively not. in this case <laughs> to Netflix. To Netflix, <laughs> yeah, I think it's I think that is slightly um, misleading. American conspiracy: colon the octopus murders uh, mm-hmm. about the suicide of Danny Castellaro, his investigation into the possible stealing of the Promise software and all of the crazy cast of characters that he encounters in investigating that whole story. I don't even know what else to say. I mean, there's just so fucking much. I will say this, because we should have said this on the opening for the last one, Uh which we are recording back to back. This is not just is this like tough to kind of like to untangle, like as a just a person reading and thinking about it and looking into it. But also we didn't do any of that on these in these episodes. <laughs> we didn't really try to, and to untangle too much of it because I think so much of our conversation is really just geared on these these guys' experience and in them yeah. trying to untangle. Well, I mean the, the thing is they made the fucking documentary. I'm right? saying if you want to learn the ins and outs of this thing, one, watch the movie. It's not my job to educate you. I don't know. If it's that's, my job to entertain you. That's okay, fair enough. But it's like edutainment. Um, it's yeah, infotainment. Uh, no, but there's so much stuff out there about this, and and it's a real crazy ride, as you can see. But I just want to, you know, if you guys are really looking for more, like, you know, I apologize if we don't didn't get into too much specifics. But there's just so much to talk there's about, so and much. it's so fun. we could have gone for like ten more episodes. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's. I think this is makes a really good companion piece to the documentary. Absolutely, so we absolutely. get into a lot of stuff they couldn't, they didn't have time or whatever yeah. for legal reasons can't cover in there. Which means go back through your emails, find your ex boyfriend's Netflix password, mm-hmm. and fucking get on that. Get on that. It's uh, it's your last name plus seventy seven as a tribute to punk rock. Um, also, Ghost Stories for the End of the World, a uh, friend of the show, has a great ten part series mm. on the octopus as well. Uh, and, uh, yeah, let's just fucking, let's play the interview.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to True and On. We have with us here, and I'm so excited, part two of our interview with the two guys who made that documentary about the dude who fucked the octopus, from what I can understand, from the one sheet we were handed by a mute vizier type of figure that uh, approached us from Netflix wearing a, a conical hat, very clearly displaying the fact that he had been gelded uh, much like a... Uh, a, a horse or, or, or certain dogs, although I guess they don't cut the penises off of dogs. Just fucking playing. We have with us here Zachary Trites. Trites? Trites. Trites, hailing straight from Sudeten land. Uh, and Christian Hansen, uh, one of the unfortunately not musically inclined Hansen brothers, uh, who are here to talk about their now out documentary, American Conspiracy. The Octopus movies. Thank you, and forgive me for that introduction. The Octopus Murders. The Octopus... What did I say? You said movies. The Octopus movies? <laughs> American That's fine Conspiracy. Too. The four Octopus versions, movies. Four new versions yeah. of the movie about the guy who fucked the octopus. Yeah, it's, our, if, it's our Lars von Trier five obstructions. Yes. <laughs> what if this time we approach it like an M.M. Octopus threesome? Anyways, we last left off uh, in Cabazon, and now we are kind of going up to San Francisco to talk about the murder of Michael Reconosciuto's business partner. But before that, I want to back up a little bit and talk about Michael Reconosciuto himself because he is one of the most key players of both the octopus story in terms of like the – Ale- uh, the alleged story of everything that happened, and in like the octopus, I guess you would call it like just narrative in general. Mm-hmm. Um, I was thrilled to find that you guys actually pick up Reconosciuto from prison, which I was shocked about because I'm going to be honest. If I'm in prison for 26 years, the last thing I want to find is um, upon my release is two guys and my cousin waiting for me. Right. Um, what was that? We also like offered to take him out to dinner wherever he wanted to go. <laughs> wherever he wanted to go. Where did he we want to go? We were going to Santa Barbara. We pulled up in front of this taco place that had great reviews, and he was like, he took one look at it and he was like, "This place is gentrified." And <laughs> he it, said it, gentrified. Yeah, and he's been in prison for twenty six years. <laughs> wow. Um, and so then we went Shit's to. Changed, he's like, "Can brother? we just go to a Denny's? Can we just? Can we not just go to a Denny's?" He's and, on his Austin Powers and it, shit. And it's like, really, you, you've you been in prison for 26 years and you want to go to Denny's right it's now. It's like, not nah, they microwave the eggs. It's like prison. But that's well, that's Emily's theory. What I don't know if we're even allowed to go into that, but, you know. What? Mm, Denny's is like, there's a lot of stories that involve Denny's. Some strange, you know, it's a, it's a through line through a lot of strange stories. Like a so, lot of important meetings mm. oh, have happened this, at uh, Denny's. Yeah, happened not just in our thing, and like in lots general. of like... Thing. Like, yeah. Tom O'Neill, I think Tom O'Neill had a lot of Denny's meetings, probably. Well, yeah. it's open 24 hours. It's, <laughs> it's one open. of the few places that is in a lot of suburban towns. Well, so we, we, we picked him up after 26 years of, you know, 26 years earlier, he had gone to prison and Danny Castellero had met him that first weekend that he got arrested. Yeah. And he got arrested for a drug charge for ma- manufacturing he is a an amateur chemist. Well, professional oh, well, chemist, actually, because he sold he, it for money, he, allegedly, he, from the government. Well, I guess— It depends on who you ask, right? He would say—or the government would say, this guy is a major manufacturer of methamphetamine and other drugs. They would say and pro. He would say— yeah. yeah. And he would say, I was wrongly accused and arrested for—because uh, I had come up— out with the truth about what happened to the Promise software and all the people that I was dealing with out at Cabazon and all the and various as, machinations as, of whacking up. As to the questions of, well, what about what about all those esoteric chemicals that you had on your property? Well, he was um, he was taking um, detritus from um, abandoned copper mines, uh, some uh, material called slag, and he was um, he had come up with a chemical process of uh, extracting. Precious metals from um, from slag? from mine, mining slag, and I think he was. Look, I, what, what, what was it was? Uh, what the Greenwood pile? Yeah, there were various metals that slag. he was getting. Oh, oh well, he was he was, he was extracting I think he was platinum. He, I, yeah, I think one of the the sort of encapsulation is like he came up with a 
cost-effective way to extract precious minerals like platinum and gold and various uh-huh. things from previously, you know, slag is previously processed ores, yeah. right? Or previously processed minerals. And so it's like a cold, you know, a cold chemical method that that you get more out of it than what you put in. Interesting. Uh, and he has... And so was it, it wasn't 20, meth. 250 was, tons of slag like, in various <laughs> places. Maybe the, some of the same, his explanation, some of the same chemicals he used to make meth. To extract, or what you extract plat- platinum with in right. his wow. process. But also when he was, so that was in 1991 mm-hmm. when he was uh, arrested for that. Uh, but in 1972 or th- or so, he was, uh, he was arrested for uh, manufacturing PCP. In a um, in a lab that you actually had to enter th- with scuba gear, <laughs> you know it was like the, it was on a river it, in a boat, and the like interest was below. Interesting, because he had a, he had a lot of surveillance um, happening. I, I talked to the DEA dude who ran that investigation against him in the seventies, and they were watching him from the bridges on the tops of the buildings, and they they was watching this dude scuba. And then the pickup, the drops were also in these sealed containers in the, the you might know the Pacific Northwest better than me. uh, Thankfully, not the Duwamish River that goes through Tacoma. (laughs) Thankfully, dude. Uh, And uh, yeah, and so they would pick up the the materials, and and so they couldn't. They had a tough time busting him. Then when um, the he was on trial. Obviously, he's doing scientific testing on the water, right? Mm-hmm. That's he's, his, his story. He, that's yeah, what he he's says doing, he's doing. He's, yeah, but so that's kind just of his like MO. of his own volition. He's just doing scientific testing on the water, right? The, the thing is that he was a child science prodigy, right? Yeah. Like that's that sort of objectively seems to be the the, the case here. When he was, um, in, you know, at nine or so, he won a big science fair. He was he was. Um, we have we found articles in the paper of him having rewired his neighborhood with its own uh own like competing system to the to the bell mm-hmm. uh, you know telephone system he that was, was like, free re- rewired um, and by the time he was sixteen he's in the Stanford lab physics lab of Arthur Schala Doctor Arthur Schala who essentially invented the laser the maser it was called at the time but the mm-hmm. laser um, and he's doing laser research there uh, at, at sixteen by the age of twenty two yeah he's getting involved with the drug thing um, it, it, just uh, since you're San Fran- you guys are San Francisco he yeah. attended high school at an all boys school called the Woodside Priory in um, in Palo Alto it's in um, it's the what's that valley it's called? the upscale valley where the guys that did the Coach- uh, the Chowchilla kidnapping lived um, starts with a P. Portola Valley. Portola, oh, Portola Valley. Valley. Oh, Portola. It's, it's like a very exclusive. This is something we don't dive into in the sh- in the show at all. But it's 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 worth mentioning. I feel like right that Doug Vaughn's analysis of he's somebody we interviewed, a, a journalist. Um, he he did research into Michael and talked about how that school allegedly. Well, it was a Hungarian. It was Hungarian um, uh, priests, priests or, or or monks, I guess, mm. who had. Who were who had been anti-communist in Hungary and and allegedly had worked with the CIA and State Department over there, you know, in their anti-communist efforts. And then after the after they when they left Hungary, they came to the Portola Valley, founded this school, and dug this. And it was a journalist. school for troubled troubled boys. Uh huh. Mm, I never heard it, of it. Now rich, it's a good like rich, school. It's a good yeah. school now. I think yeah. it's, you know, we don't want to cast too many aspersions. But I, when I went and but, visited, I was but that, that it had been importantly a, in his telling, a recruitment ground for um, child c- prodigies c- c- for 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 the CIA. And it's like, is that true? Like, how could you even prove that ever? But it's an interesting thing. You've got these monks who worked with the Central Intelligence Agency, and they're dealing with all these kids. Yeah, and like, well, you're spotting talent. I, I would do it. Yeah. If I were yeah. Guys. And and so then, you know, that's San Francisco and, you know, then Michael turns up at this avant-garde theater on Haight and Ashbury or the Haight area called the Straight Theater. Uh-huh. Um where he uh, at one point, and this is a, a story I, I learned from the founders of the theater, not from Michael. He never even told me this story. The night that um, Ken Kesey did a, a thirty-minute rap along to the Warlocks, the predecessors of the Grateful yeah, Dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or not Ken Kesey. 
not Ken Kesey, Neil Cassidy. Sorry. Okay, yeah. Um, the night that Neil Cassidy did this like rap, um, Michael Riccanosciuto had brought a laser from Stanford and was like, you know, projecting it, you know, around <laughs> his like, stomach and stuff. Yeah, as he, like, like kind of talking about it, I think, during this thing. As a, you know, piece, piece of the lighting and look at this cool new Well, that was a big technology. thing back then in, the, in, the, in San Francisco in the 60s. There's like light shows by some yeah. people. So, and so there's a way be... you could see Michael as this this guy who comes out of the counterculture movement and kind of moves into the the – you know, as it goes from acid, if you want to think of it that way, I think it's a good way to think stuff, of it. Acid into the speed. into the into the speed years later on in the seventies and eighties. He's also adamant with us in that car ride when we picked him up. Was adamant that he was part of COINTELPRO Pro New Left. He was part of. He was. He was like I worked for the I FBI was in, as yeah, part of COINTELPRO. He was like there was a communist threat. The communists had been in, the hippie movement had been infiltrated by communists, and I was. Keep helping keep tabs on what was going on as, as an informant. Yeah, interesting. So he his whole thing is he's like I was like both informant and target, which actually but also be. loves the music of San Francisco, and he's turned me on to some amazing <laughs> bands yeah. from Joy that Cooking. era. Yeah, this oh, band Joy, called I, the Joy, yeah, of Joy Cooking. Cooking. Yeah, um, that's interesting. But also, like, you didn't really need Cointelpro to infiltrate the hippie movement, as it pretty much did the work of Cointelpro by its very nature of like depoliticizing people and getting people to tune in, just drop out or whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, but he's such a fascinating character that you guys get in, involved with that Danny himself had been involved with, and it's, you know, it, it's it's there's a there's a a part in this where. You actually reenact Danny Casalero going looking for this cassette that Michael Riccanosciuto told him was like out in the like this wilderness. A very strange story, um, and I feel like that's so emblematic of like uh kind of mo because like he he kind of is, is like sending this tantalizing information like all the answers are here, but it, all it does is just like obfuscate more and like add more confusion and really waste. Danny Casalero's time. Yeah. His uh, someone said Michael Riccanosciuto's favorite words are I've got the document, I've got the photo, I've got it on film. You know, but you'll never see it, you know. Yeah. Which we found to be you know, dealing with Michael, I found him to be a very uh, when I first learned about him from Christian and met him, I was a huge skeptic of his. I mean, I'm still a skeptic of pretty much anybody in this story, but as you check out more, more. He speaks very quickly. Drops a lot of names. There's a lot of stuff in there. Some of it's true. Some of it's not. Fundamental stories that I thought were total bullshit turned out to be true in a way that I. It's just kind of amazing like to me now. Um, some of the stories about, I mean, like like what happened to with Paul Morosca and the things that happened in San Francisco and the people he was dealing with, people like Philip Arthur Thompson, which we can get into. You know, it's like. Or in, just in like my if, mind. I, if you met him at, um, you were wandering around San Bernardino and you met him at a, a, you know, a car parts store or something and you struck up a conversation and you didn't know anything about this and he said, yeah, you know, back in the 80s I used to work on this Native American reservation. I was a director of research for the Wackenhut Corporation, which was, a, and we were, man, and you'd be like, yeah, whatever. And he's, the way he's presenting it and talking so fast, it's like, there's basic things, basic parts of his story that are true that are absurdly fictional sounding. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know what you mean. Getting even to his the the Maraska murder. Right. I mean, it is a real verifiable fact that his actual real life business partner was murdered in a pretty spectacular fashion. Yeah. Um, and the way that you guys get into that in, in this is 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 fascinating because it seems like Philip Arthur Thompson uh, is kind of who you like point the finger at. It's like this guy probably did it. Yeah. And he was both an FBI informant. Yes. And he was also, which is proven, you got you show the documents, but he was also legitimately part of uh, Reconosciuto's like circle. You know, like he had shown up and just like started hanging out with them one day. His dad was paying him to to be like his whatever friend. How the fuck did his dad get in contact? That 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 was the question his I had. His dad, you know, got into contact with Philip Arthur Thompson through through John Nichols, essentially. I mean, it's it's hard. It's, there's <laughs> there there is a 
a lot of people, everybody that involved in this triangle has a different uh, explanation as to how Philip Arthur Thompson enters into their lives. And then, and then Philip Arthur Thompson's explanation, you know, a fourth take is that he first met Michael back in the early sixties in San Francisco. But w- the way that um, w- they're basically the account from Michael is that the FBI was we we mentioned that Michael had a business partner who was murdered Paul Maraska. Yeah. The business that they were in was um drug is drug business, drug wholesale operation. Illegal drugs. Illegal drugs, yeah. He he had Paul was was moving cocaine. They also had like a huge supply of um Precursor. precursor chemicals to make uh, methamphetamine. Like when we talk about huge supply, though, I think it's important to mention like train the car, scale. Train that we're talking car. About. Loads. We're talking about we're talking about phenyl acetic acid. We're talking about you, you. Basically, need two. Yeah. Two major two two, two important ingredients, right? Pseudo and Michael had. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Michael had access to. I think Paul had said, "Like, hey, can you get me some like phenyl acetic acid?" And Michael was like. Well, I, I can't get you like a little, but I can get you a tr- like a, an entire train card load of it. Like two was it two tons or something like that? It was it was something massive, right? And when you're dealing with that kind of volume, you got to think about like w- people we've talked to about it who just had who know that business. You know, it's just like you don't really get access to that without having some kind of government connection. Um, <laughs> and that that. Um, May, a and then massive the way, amount the of way they got the phenyl acetic acid is, is also fascinating. There's a guy who the guy that actually coined the term zero waste. He's a yeah. kind of an amazing, brilliant guy, and and bless, bless his heart, you know, he has dedicated his life to tracking down unwanted vats of chemical product and finding um, somebody who wants them. Someone who wants them, and rather than it getting tossed because like. I, I bought this old factory and there's a vat of whatever on it. Throw it in the river. Throw yeah. it in the river. No, it's like, here you could, and so he. Here you can make math. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, he, he, he has, he's a uh, recycling visionary. Yeah. But he also, um, you know, knew Michael and he had connections to the DEA. Like they knew kind of what he, what he was up to. Uh, I mean, th- there's a published account and then there's his account and he, I don't know. Basically, he, he hooked them up with the phenyl acetic acid or he yeah, told them where yeah. they should get it. Yeah, it was phenyl acetic acid and there was... And then there was monomethylamine, mono, mono, which Michael... Sorry, Michael got the monomethylamine. My, my, Michael got the monomethylamine. I'm sorry, yeah. Those are the two important ingredients. Yeah. But also, it's important to highlight, they're not like moving drugs on a on a fucking corner. Like, they, I mean, no, these are train cars, train cars yeah. that are Massive. loading into... And something we don't really get into, I wish we had in, this, in the story, is just the background of Michael's father owned the town of Hercules... Which is outside of San Francisco. Lived there. Yeah. Yeah. So Hercules, Hercules was is a where, dynamite like, manufacturing facility. I didn't know that. Yeah. And so it was a dynamite town, essentially, because yeah. it was such a big factory. And he bought that plant and essentially bought the town. And Michael had a lab. Like a Michael had a lab there. Chemistry lab there. They pull up the train into the dynamite facility. You can pull up a whole train car, you know? And there are other interesting people working from like the Lawrence Livermore lab out of there. They had a kitty litter mine. Mm. Uh, somewhere else down the coast doing, yeah. doing kitty uh, litter is mine kid, they, kid, they, kitty litter it's yeah. diatomaceous, diatomaceous earth, earth. Yeah. you know we what? use That's like in bed a, bugs in the like yeah. deserty central valley like I think probably close to Trona ish. I lost my husband in the kitty little mine. <laughs> wow. And so so my, Michael that had. That's toxic. Uh, Michael you had. You get back lung, you dive a hairball. M- Michael's dad, Marshall, is a super interesting character that del- there's his own whole freaking podcast or whatever. He was a guy who, his name's mentioned. Christian found his name several times in the Warren report. Marshall. Marshall, Marshall Rikana He was he was um he was he was in a, he was in a with, business partner with, with Pat- one of the three hobos from yes. the can, yeah, this guy yeah. named Fred Christman. And Craig Christman interviewed by uh, uh Gar- Garrison, Jim Garrison. Jim Garrison. Uh yeah, there's a there's an interview with with Christman by Jim Garrison oh, on wow. the internet too, yeah. Right. And so uh he's also in business with this guy Patrick Moriarty who was a um had a fireworks empire. They had a fireworks empire called uh, Red Devil. Red Devil Fireworks. And and Moriarty, we called his 
nephew or something like that. He was like, you know, my dad was the first, um, you know, non-government official to go into China and during the detente. And it's like, ah, like okay. you're a fireworks guy. You're going over to China. Oh. And, and also California, politics, Republican, Nixon. Republican. Yeah. There's this whole like kind of Republican, intelligence-related, politically connected group and Marshall – is a part of that milieu. Also, that, the so Disneyland knows, fireworks every night that go off over the— That's Red Devil? That's, that was Red Devil. That was that Red was, Devil. That was my father's company. Of a, that's a hell of a—that's a little connection to have there. Yeah. Interesting. And so, yeah, I mean, his— None of that made it into the movie, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> it was just too much. But but that's the kind of world that Michael's coming from. He's, he's, he's a brilliant kid, science prodigy, has a— Knack for doing chemistry. Sometimes that knack seems to get him into trouble. And he's got this partner, Paul Morosca, who wants a shit ton of chemicals to to make, or doesn't even want that many, but lands with this shit ton of, of chemicals, very extremely valuable chemicals. But he, he also has a, you know, kind of a, a contract, if you will, a certain amount of, a, a huge shipment of Coke every month comes from, New York that he offloads. Yeah. You know, he's got, he's, you know, a pretty heavy uh, businessman. And so they were moving these drugs through Cabazon? No. Well, I, money Not that the, they were using for Cabazon for the night vision stuff, Paul was was an investor in some yeah. of that stuff. And and John Nichols had, had, had mentored Michael and mentored Paul through Michael into starting a company that they were all working on together, developed a night vision, kind of a laundry, part of it's kind of laundering some of this drug money into the the intelligence. The theme of like uh, doing scientific research, but also doing drugs. The company was called Recovery Technology Inc., (laughs) which is very reminiscent of in 1991 when he's trying to recover. and, And he says that they're trying to do the same thing then, but meanwhile, there's... Okay, and so, th- so they have this massive amount of – Paul, his partner, has a massive amount of precursors, right? So that seems like, uh, you know, where value comes, comes and, that, and it's hidden. It's hidden. The, 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 it's, it's a pretty complicated story, but they're basically waiting for one dude to get out of hiding. And so they're going to cook it all before they sell it. So the, the, the precursors are, are hidden in an abandoned mine in Nevada. And Jesus. they're basically waiting – for like the time to be right, and then they're going to cook it and <laughs> and, and so b- there'll be tens they'll of be, millions of dollars worth of drugs. So yeah. much money. So um, they, and John Philip Nichols knows all this stuff, and he's having his own money problems himself. Right, with the casino, like he, you know, he's in the arms business and all this stuff. But like the casino actually was having so many legal problems because they were fighting yeah, the government yeah. and doing all this stuff, and and perhaps who knows where the money ultimately was going at the time as well. And the casino went. You know, this is kind of Christian's own point in the movie and research that he did. It's like the casino went bankrupt in December of 81. Yeah. And a month later, Michael's partner, this drug mover, Paul, is hogtied, is found in his apartment, hogtied, strangled to death. Yeah. Like clearly tortured. Clearly tortured. He seems to have been alive for a while. And he lived on – what did he live on? He lived on Kearney and uh, like right on uh, – Telegraph Hill. Yeah, yeah like right where that walkway Swiss is where Chalet. people take the, sel- the selfies. What, what's yeah. the – The broad – Like up near, near Co- like towards Coit Tower, right? Yeah. Like right. up on yeah. the yeah. hill you towards can, You Coit. can step out and see yeah. Coit from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's what uh, – he's, he's like – he's – Michael is the one who finds the body. Michael Michael – Goes over to his house. We haven't introduced Philip Arthur Thompson. We, we haven't explained. But, 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 but Mike, Mike, Michael goes to. I just think it's right, important okay. to mention. Like Michael's the one who went over to his partner's house and finds the body. Does not call the cops. Does not do anything. He calls a guy named John Philip Nichols, who we know, Doctor John Nichols, seven hundred miles away mm-hmm. at Cabazon, and John Nichols says. Get down here, you know. And so Michael drives overnight there, and and eventually they alert the police that there's a body sitting there in Telegraph Hill, and the police, one of the detectives we interviewed, is thrust into this world that we kind of like already know about, you know. By the time you know us yeah, in this room, but also in like, the movie, he, basically a, a lawyer in L.A. that he's still alive. I won't mention him. Fascinating guy. He. Uh, he calls the San Francisco Police Department. It's like if you go, you'll you'll find a you'll find a body at this house, and you know. So then, all right, 
the the police go find the body. It's tied very strangely. They call this lawyer back and they say, "Okay, what's going on here?" You know, uh, <laughs> and, and like, and, like wh- and he's like, "Well, I can you introduce know you to this? the guy that told me about it." You know, he's uh, he's currently in uh, Palm Springs area, but it's my understanding that he's on his way to L.A. and he would love to he would love to speak to you. Interesting. And so that's when they meet Michael, and you know, Michael. It tells the detectives, you know, well, you know, basically he seems distraught. We have this, you know, on tape this this call, and he seems um, very concerned and and distraught. And it doesn't, you don't get the impression that Michael killed, killed him. Paul. Yeah. Um, but then, like, he asks, like, well, was it sexual? What do you think? He asks the police that, and you're also like, so what is? Why would he ask that? Like, you saw it, like. He yeah. saw the, the – it, it's not like – It's not a sexual – yeah. And, and, and Michael uh, sounds – he also seems very innocent on those calls. He, he's, he, he says at one point, he's like, he died pretty hard, didn't he? And it's like, oh, fuck. Because, I mean, strangle – the body had been sitting there too. I'm sure there was blow. There was, he says yeah, there's yeah, an incredible yeah. smell. You know, I mean, you're sitting there and you, this guy that you know in his apartment and he's, you know, he's dead. Um, and – and Michael, I think, over the course of time, he comes to believe that the reason that he's dead is because of John Philip Nichols and the opportunity that presented itself where John Nichols essentially hooked him up with an FBI informant slash serial killer named Philip Arthur Thompson. And and to put a fine point on this, Philip Arthur Thompson was being paid by Michael Reconosciuto's Dad. Yes. In the months leading up in to this. In the months leading up to this. Michael Rashonashuto's father was Who's paying, paying John Nichols a salary already to do you know mental health help on yeah. Michael. And, and and then John Nichols is like, well, there's another guy that you should use because I can't, you know, I can't <laughs> he says in and oh my god, it's the most amazing I think it's the most amazing part of our entire show, the most amazing line. He explains John Nichols explains the reasoning behind why he's telling Marshall that he should hire John uh Philip Arthur Thompson to look over my he says, Sometimes a sociopath can help a psychopath. Yes. Very it's a matter of fact. He's like, great you know that. He's like a psycho uh, a sociopath can help a psychopath. And it's like you sit there and you think. I I listen to it, I was just like a uh, what can help a what? It's what? like saying the Kentucky Derby is the first Saturday in May every single year. Yeah, yeah. A so sociopath can help a psychopath. And, and you hear Eddie in these in these conversations. He's just like, okay, <laughs> like, you know, you just it's beyond normal understanding of what this guy is doing. And and John Nichols, he's there, you know, talking to Eddie, the detective, like he's just, I want to help you in any way I can. Yeah, you know, and it's like. He just lures you right in. There's another line where he's like, he, Eddie's father was the former coach of the of the Raiders. Yeah, right? Oakland Raiders. And he, and he's, he was like, he's like, your father was an amazing coach. That must make you pretty young, huh? And he's like, oh, I guess, I, I guess it does. He's like, mm-hmm. And you can just almost hear him like kind of lining Weird. Eddie up and being like, a hey, young detective, this shouldn't be that hard. Yeah, yes. Wow. I mean, it's just, I mean, th- I think that's a really extraordinary aspect because there's pretty clear evidence uh that uh, Philip Arthur Thompson is a serial killer yeah. in a way that that is actually beyond the remit of this story and, like, killed m- possibly multiple people while definitely working for, as an informant for the FBI, uh-huh. which ties into, like, a whole other realm of, like, 60s, 70s, 80s stuff around yeah. serial killers and government contact uh, that is that is sort of extraordinary. And it looks like he, he, he eventually does get busted for murder, too, which... yes. As do, like... Thanks to the family of one of the victims, uh, they, like, really put the squeeze on. But, I mean, I talked to a district attorney, a retired DA, who was just convinced that he was a a CIA. Like, he did jobs overseas. Mm -hmm. He he wasn't just, like, a... Yeah. He didn't just rape and kill women in the U.S. for his own pleasure. He also, like, had, had foreign assignments. And and there's a lot of evidence that he was uh, running guns to El Salvador. Wow. It certainly turns up a lot in this. And, and there was multiple stories about him. You know, it's very going, likely that we'll do going, f- another yeah, we'd film like about to, like, him. Yeah, we'd like to explore this further. But, like, he was going in and out of jail and prison constantly. Yes. Okay? But – Getting out and sometimes going on, uh, you know, just on leave from prison in, in certain ways. Federal agents would check him out 
Or just check him like out. A, like it was like like yeah. it was a library book. What or was just, it? The DA told to Christian. I remember him saying something like, "It, it was like you know." He had a, you know, some people have a, have a, have a Mastercard, you know, in life. They have a Visa. This guy had a platinum card. Okay, he get, he was able to access things that, you know, that was his metaphor for it. I was just like, I guess that kind of works. It just it's, it's very like, reminiscent of like the like you know, the, the Dave McGowan stuff and, and chaos and like it's just it's such of a especially it's where it took a place similar to era and yeah. and cast of characters and 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 we talked to. Tom O'Neill, and he was kind of a big inspiration and hero for us. We, we share characters, you know. Yeah. And, and, and if you haven't read the book, it's Chaos by Tom O'Neill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Um, and the hey, you know, Michael, in his San Francisco days, used to go to the Haight-Ashbury Free Medical Clinic oh, and guess. says that he knows Jolly West. Interesting. He would say that. He would, yeah. Well, but the, he also kind of acts like he's like he uh, might have been a part of the program. Like, does he, Michael Ricardo Shooter himself sort of hints that he might have been an MK Ultra either yeah, yeah. S- subject yeah, he's or hinted practitioner? And, and said it, yeah. He it, said that Jolly West, at one time he said, he was like, oh, he's one of the good guys. It's like, oh, but his brain's, interesting. if you think that, if you know him, your brain is potentially <laughs> well, very even scrambled. The, I would say that, that killing the elephant, even if you are like the biggest anti communist, like mind control crusader in the world, the elephant thing, probably unnecessary. The elephant's a bridge too far. Yeah, I mean, Rakana Shoot is such an interesting figure in this. And it's what was it like dealing with all of these people, Robert Booth Nichols being one of them as well, um, that have this like this strange like aura of like complete bullshit. I mean, at one point, Christian, you look in the camera and you're like, all of these people are insane. Yeah. Uh, and the viewer feels a lot of sympathy for you in that moment because certainly the the footage that had just been shown helps illustrate that. Um, I, and, I, and I feel very self-conscious about that scene. I think it's a powerful scene, but I, I don't think that the Casalero family, you know, are this insane. It's I, I, you know, I understand that you probably feel like because oh, I, I say I all these people, I definitely it's don't mean that. Very yeah, obvious. Yeah, I think it's to very clear. Okay. You're, not talking, you're not talking about <laughs> Tony Casalero, who's like <laughs> extremely sweetest. measured yeah. and like very clearly not okay, insane. Good. Yeah. Um, I mean, what is it like sort of like coming up against this? Because it seems like Casalero, that is like one of the theories about Danny Casalero's, like if he committed suicide, right? Yeah. Is that he was taken in by this group of hucksters who like are bad people who genuinely did cr- crazy shit uh, but were lying and sort of stringing him along with this story. You guys essentially take up from where he ended there and like it, kind of are subject to the same forces of just like – Smoke and mirrors, and just like dazzle and bullshit, right. but then also these like this like line of truth beneath all. We of it. were able to document so much of the supposedly bullshit stuff that these crank crackpots were telling Danny, um, but they also are like, you know, every other, you know they they do lie and they are very confusing people to deal with. They're also it's fun, you know, but it is interesting when you get to a point when like. You, it's pretty exciting when you first get to know these guys. Yeah, but then when you know you you realize you've been in been in it too long, when you roll your eyes, you're like, oh god, he's calling. Yeah, you know, you don't even want to deal with it anymore. But you know, whenever you talk to like Michael, for instance, it's always it, a, since we met him in 2017, he's always been on the brink of being hunted down and killed, and he's always just like. I am fighting for my life, <laughs> and it's one of one of the things he's. And at a certain point, you'll say, and "I feel bad if Michael hears this, but you know, what? what well, you seem like okay. Like you, the worst thing that happened is your heart from all the stress you're putting on yourself. Mm-hmm. Like who's who's f- f- chasing you? But then like, you've been good like for you five years, and then you have, but you have the history of it's like. People die around Michael. You know, it's yeah. Like, yeah. There's a lot of I mean, people he who walk, die let, in let his me past. Tell you, I walk in and and I'm not going to use you as an example. And uh, uh, Young Chomsky has been trussed and slaughtered in an apartment. I might be paranoid for the yeah, rest of my life. For sure. You know, and 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 that energy lives with them, and it's that's that's the problem. It's like you just never know exactly where anybody's coming from. And there's in my mind. 
I came to believe that there's a, a point to that. And I don't know if it's, a, if it's an overall point, an overarching point that the octopus is like this, is this ultimate conspiracy or whatever, but it's, that it's a, it's a, it's a play. It's a, it's like a, it's a dance. It's like a piece of jazz that's being improvised, but there's people who are better at it and people who are worse at it. And they're all playing this kind of game. And it's how Michael plays it is, uh, you know, he has information that he knows is true, I think, and information that he knows is false. And he uses that and seeds it out into the world. And it gives him ability to kind of move around and see what's going on and see who's talking to who because you can see what information passes to whom. And it's it's fascinating. And it also, I think that smokescreen allows for a lot of the people in this story to get away with the things that we talk about people getting away with. People get away with murders. People get away with enormous drug deals and enormous amounts of money and arms and intelligence operations all around the world because it's all just too damn confusing for anybody to really parse it. It's designed confusing. Well, I think there's like almost like two different projects that are sometimes seem like the same thing but maybe aren't where there's like, and, and I'm curious if you guys felt like this because I, my understanding of like Danny's project is that he kind of ran into this issue which is that there's sort of like this idea of trying to find the quote unquote truth, mm. which this idea that there is this sort of like determine, like determinist like reality that can be like, you know, you can strip away everything and you can understand like what happened when, why, where, all of those answers and like it's makes sense and it's clear. And then there's a story. And like sometimes those things are maybe like different projects. And there's something about like, I mean, at least you know, from what I've read and what I understand, like Danny couldn't figure out what the story was that he wanted to tell, maybe because he got too obsessed with this idea that he could figure out the truth. And like, at least in my, my, I mean, I'll just say like speaking for myself, like I think that that project of like figuring out this like exact thing is one like pretty much impossible um, and just never ending, but also maybe not, like there's something to like figuring out the story and like you know an interpretation I guess I would say like there is I think sorry I don't mean to like monologue here but I think like we have this idea in 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 our kind of like understanding of like interpretation that that's like different than like there's like there's truth and there's like interpretation like those are two different things that are at odds but it to me like and in other languages too interpretation means like your version of like laying out the story like this is how I interpret the world. This is how I lay things out. I think that's like even like the German word for interpretation is like to lay things out. And in some ways that can be like more, almost like more um, insightful than the idea of getting to this like determined thing because the idea of an interpretation is that it's supposed to kind of like wake you up, to like shock you and to show you things that you weren't, you couldn't see before, to like illuminate things and to kind of present something that can kind of make sense. And so it's almost like in getting into the details and the truth of all these things, you kind of get bogged down and you're unable to kind of actually lay out something that can you know, help us understand something a bit more. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. One little thing I'll throw to Christian, but I think that's why on, on last time we were talking, the last episode, we were talking about, I, I was so insistent on sort of seeing the perspective of where things came from, the yeah. sort of like source of the information. And that's why ultimately, you know, Danny's in the movie, we see his perspective on things and we see him as a character and how his thinking evolves and devolves kind of at the same time over the course of it. And then it was important for us to, just be extremely subjective and put ultimately ourselves and me, my view of Christian's interpretation of Danny. Mm. You kind of can't understand it without, you know, it's like a physics experiment or something, like without being a, a part of it, without affecting it, right. you know what I mean? And you can't really understand this bigger picture without understanding what it's doing to you and how you're interpreting it because the subjectivity is, is, is how you have to see it. And it's also, like you're saying, I mean, it's, there kind of is no... There, maybe there's an objective reality, but it's it's not one that anybody can grasp, really. Like, ultimately, it's it's as complicated as life itself, you know? Like, there's unending connections between mm. all of these people and in the intelligence world that we go into. 
that's that's just really useful, like I was saying. You well, know? And, and at a certain point, you have to decide what you think. You have to say, like, oh, okay, I believe that he's telling the truth or not, or it doesn't matter if I think, you know, it, it doesn't matter if he is or not. I'm going to still go with this lead. I'm going to still go with this hunch. And so you inevitably are going to end up crafting something, whether you mean to or not. I mean, I think if, if Danny had funding and a research assistant and, like... And a Netflix deal. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. He would... <laughs> Um, I think what the book likely would have been was a character study of different people within the stratosphere yeah. or the stratification of the intelligence world. Because, you know, we look at the different people that he wants to feature in the story. It's like, uh, you know, John Philip Nichols and this guy George Pinder who are like totally obscure, kind of small fry freelancers. And you go all up and up to um, – the you know George H W Bush right. and and if you do said if, if you were to tell like a um, through the the eyes of these tangible characters that you can really flesh out with color and, and events and stories you'd get a pretty good sense of the this secret world of intelligence and fake history and stuff um, the and the other point that I wanted to make. This book, The Devil's Chessboard by mm-hmm. David Talbot. Have mm-hmm. either of you read that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that is like if Danny had that. I mean, that that really, like, that's the octopus. You know, that um, Alan Dulles. I mean, yeah. this guy is like manipulating. If that book is true, which I, it's pretty well researched, yeah. this one person is drastically changing the course of history from the Holocaust to the Kennedy assassination. Yeah. <laughs> in a very like, and that book is very a sober a take on, very much on that. So. And so then, and and, and you know, um, uh, <laughs> Danny doesn't mention Alan Dulles, but you know, it's just an interesting like. There yeah, he are, mentions all those guys, those yeah. OSS. Yeah, I mean, that's what he was really, really yeah, became he, ultimately interested in was the OSS, good old boy network of the intelligence community. People like Alan Dulles, yeah. right? And and I also yeah I guess I just I feel like Danny, it's important to note like also we just don't have everything right it's like Danny died he didn't finish his book and our project is an f- extremely subjective way of Christian talking about how he's trying to finish his book you know and so like I don't know I don't want I'm not sitting here like defending Danny or something I have no real dog in that fight or something but I just think it's like this idea that he was just like totally out on a limb and had no idea what he was doing it's like he did. So much in a year, you yeah. know, found yeah. so much stuff and put it together. And, like, yeah, other journalists had written about part of this stuff. That's research. You research part of that. He was kind of putting this, you know, what was kind of like an, a theory of everything, which is a very difficult thing to do. But it, it's a powerful project because you're linking all these different scandals that he had looked over the last 10, 20, 30 years. And you're finding, yeah, actually, all these guys who were Iran Contra were over there, you know, involved in, like, the bombing of Laos or like maybe the yeah. Phoenix project, the Phoenix program or, you know, it's like they're all, they are all connected. They yeah. all know each other and it's not that far off to say that they, they enrich themselves and the people around them by do, by doing things that are seemingly semi-legal or illegal depending on where you're sitting in the world and they're able to do that because of their intelligence connections. And they all basically involve like the same kinds of things, right? Like assassinations, uh, coups, uh, drugs, and oftentimes weapons smuggling. I mean, it's 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 like this is just like an mo an election of the same cartel. election bullshit an election bullshit too. <laughs> yeah, Danny yeah. called it parochial political intrigue. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you know, there's there's a very like there's a stylistic choice or a narrative choice within the documentary. Where you start, I, I think it doesn't happen in the first episode, but where uh, uh, I can't remember the woman's name, but Anne Clink, yeah, uh, no, mentions Danny's that. Friend. Yeah, Danny's friend mentions that that you, Christian, look like Danny Kessel, and you kind of do. Yeah, um, and it, that, well, that came up because I mean, when that first came out, everybody that I've met, we we Bill Hamilton was just like I remember sitting on his driveway and him being like almost uncomfortable, just being like you really look like Danny. You know, there's all this, this like ghostly thing going on. And it's like, Anne said the same. Tony said the same. First thing, his first brother, time yeah. that his his brother, T- Tony Casalero, said the same thing. But the first time that ever happened to Christian was early on, before any of this documentary or anything was happening. Christian showed up at Danny's mom's house. Tony, Tony and Danny's mom, you know, 
Um, she lived in Tony's house, and Danny's mother lived in an adjacent uh, apartment. Mm-hmm. And Tony wasn't home, so I went over and introduced myself to Danny's mother. And I was wearing um, jeans, uh, brown boots, a blue shirt. Um, I have blood hair and blue eyes. I often wear blue. Yeah. And um, a camel hair sports jacket, which is just like kind of what I would wear if I was trying to dress semi nice, wandering around DC, introducing yeah, myself yeah, to people. Yeah. But, and I, <laughs> I guess that's exactly how Danny used to dress. And his mother thought that I was like part of a prank show or something. What? You know, I had a notebook in my hand and I was like, hi, I'm here to talk about your late son. And she was like, get out of here. This is nutty. Like you are putting me on. Like she's like looking around for like where the cameras are or, mm-hmm. or something. Like she was like, this is too weird. I was, no, I was at a certain point I calmed it down. I was like, this is how writers dress. Yeah. Fair <laughs> enough. Wait, but so did that like trip you up? Like, did you realize at some point when you were like, Okay, I look like him. Now I'm like kind of taking on his project. Like Yeah, I mean, was I there think a like, bit of a <laughs> I, I think it I think it must have like subconsciously like helped me empathize with him. You know, we have we, part of your experience in the world is based on like how you look kind of because people treat you a certain mm-hmm. way mm-hmm. based on how you look and and then um you know, I come from a big loving family. He comes from a big mm-hmm. loving family. He's from Virginia. I'm from Kentucky. You know, just like I, I don't know, we, we're very similar in, in certain in certain ways. Um, kind of unconventional thinkers. Um, both have and, a background in journalism, and, and we both have a, <laughs> we both have a background in journalism. We both have a fear of blood, you know. And so, because I, when I found that he had a fear of blood and he died the way he did, that was another initial thing that was like, wait, 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 wait. What? Yeah. And yeah, and I did. I, I, I for the first many years, I'd only seen like a grainy uh, JPEG, like black and white photo of, of him, and I was, and, I, and I was twenty five. You know, he died when he was forty four. So maybe I, I looked vaguely like him. I've looked, I've as I've aged, I think. I've looked more and more like him. As we took our time with the documentary, Christian aged into the part. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. Well, you also but, have a, you have a, you have a butt chin too. Oh yeah. Uh, or cl- excuse me, a cleft chin. And Castellar also had a. Didn't he have a cleft? He had a butt chin too. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if the butt chin is like the most like <laughs> Danny part of Christian. I want to be clear here. There, that somebody, 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 somebody does not have a butt chin. <laughs> but it, you know, it, when kind of casting Christian in the role of Danny, it, you know, it wasn't this just convenience thing or something like that. It was kind of this uncanny vertigo, like, or the tenant, or there's this sort of, like, doubling, like, Hitchcockian yeah. doubling thing yeah, going yeah. on that we wanted to play. You know, there's, for me, the story is kind of like a cautionary ghost story almost. Like, Promise is almost like the, is like Jaws or something. It's like this, like, or, or Promise is like the ghost that's, that's, that's like, who knows how powerful this thing is and who knows what happens here. And, and, and Danny and Christian kind of, there's a, there's like a melding that was like really powerful and just knowing, you know, it wasn't just us being like, ah, eh, this is easy. Like throw a Christian in the role, like uh, you know, save a couple, a couple of dollars. Don't have to be yeah, sad. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was just like, we almost like didn't want to do it as everybody felt almost opportunistic and weird, but it was just like, well, we have to. It just makes too much sense, and it's getting too. Yeah. Things just are starting to get too weird in general. Let's just ma- let's just crank it up a notch and like. And I, I look forward to the opportunity as um, from a research standpoint, where you know I could use this. You know, we recreated his office to a T based really? on. Uh, yeah, based on forensic photographs from the Martinsburg and news, police. News stuff. And, yeah. And, and yeah, and news footage. We the exteriors. We don't even mention this in the show. The exteriors of Danny's house in the show. That's Danny's actual house where he actually lived. It, that house has since been bulldozed and turned into a McMansion. But I mean, all all sorts of coincidences aligned where we were able to f- f- film in that house, like right before it was bulldozed. Um, and then um, you know, so I'm in his office. I'm typing on the exact same typewriter that he had, or the the same model. It, it's not the same one. And I'm I'm writing his words. I'm in his office. I'm driving in his car. And then at this point where I had this meeting with Robert Booth Nichols, it was this really revelatory experience. Um, you'll see it in episode three. Me and 
Bob Nichols are at this hotel restaurant. And this Danny and Bob Nichols. Right. Danny we call and Bob. Him Cranny. Christian Cr- and Danny. Cranny. Yeah, that's what, yeah. That was a funny slip. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> well, you know, I'm t- this you is experience playing, I had. Yeah. Me, Danny and Bob had this meeting at the Four Seasons Hotel in D.C. And that, I recreated that, or I, I played Danny in a recreation of that. And, you know, the actor that played Bob was, like, super into the role, and he's sitting there talking, about, like, w- just riffing about arms deals and, and whacking hot and BCCI, and he's just going around, just, just in character and just talking. I'm sitting there taking notes. And, and, I'm, and I'm thinking, like, about that real night, that real evening in, in 1991. But w- why is this, this international man of mystery... Like, why is he messing around with this, like, unfunded uh, novelist slash researcher who's been poking into this guy's life in, in, mm. ma- in major ways and trying to, you know, do this character study of a guy who, at that point in time, is an unknown yeah. underworld figure? And then why are they meeting together? Why are they, you know, what's going – like, wh- why is Bob Nichols giving this guy any time? Yeah. And it was – Why do you think – I think he was getting something out of it. And what that is for me, I mean, do you want to, I mean, for me, it's like, it's an information exchange, right? Yeah. And it's like, you got journalists, you got a journalist, especially one who doesn't have like the New York Times or somebody backing him up. And he's like a go between between you and your like ex business partner, Michael Riconosciuto, who you hate allegedly. And you want to find out what Michael's saying about you. And yeah. you're using Danny. You're throwing a little information out there. He, Danny's telling Michael. Bob said this about you. You get to the, it's like a depth charge. But then yeah, Danny's at like, this time also talking to FBI agents who were investigating Robert Booth Nichols and prosecutors who were investigating Robert right. Booth Nichols. So it's a way to see what someone knows, how far along on the trail they yeah, are. How far along they're on the trail. And, right. and there, there is every possibility I think for our minds that Bob, who's. <laughs> Just an amazing other character. May or may really not be dead, it. actually. May or may not be dead. Right. But it is 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 sitting there, and it you know Bob's just a, a guy, who very I, from all accounts, very in, intelligent, somewhat maybe sociopathic, if you want to throw some words around, um, person who does who's a criminal, um, and I mean that, like I use that word like it means something, but you know he's a he's a money launderer and arms yeah. dealer and and. Possibly other stuff, um, and and also seems to work with people. Who definitely worked with people in the intelligence world. Um, Bob Mayhew. Like, there's a whole, whole other like sort of web of connections around Bob that's almost separate from Michael. Um, and like he's he's maybe he slipped up. You know, he he would drink, and make, maybe he just said something to Danny, or Danny found out something that he just really shouldn't have mentioned. You yeah. know, shouldn't have said. And I think that's there's a lot of danger in there for. For Danny to meet with a guy like that, and that meeting like was pretty late in Danny's life, kind of. It was just um, a few weeks before Danny died. Yeah, and it's it's uh, you know, I think Danny, if anybody says anything that, that's true about him, it's kind of negative. It's like he was very naive. And at the meeting, Dan- Danny, according to Tony, after that weekend that he spent with Robert Booth Nichols, Robert told um, had told Danny that weekend, "You know too much. Now you're going to have to die." Interesting. Which which Danny like told Tony, he's like, I don't know what he means. You know, I don't like know if he it's wasn't, like a joke he wasn't or reporting a threat this like, or whatever. He wasn't reporting this in a melodramatic way. He told his brother, like, this guy said this weird thing to me. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, or he was like, but maybe it was a joke. Like, yeah. maybe he was, you know, he might have been like, or maybe he's warning me about somebody else. You know, there's all these threats coming in. And it's kind of, you kind of get to the point looking at Danny's notes, like how Christian interpreted them. And it is like, it, it's almost like you know, the question is like from the police is like ah he was dealing with all these like weirdos who didn't know anything who were just like leading him on and stuff and like when we look at it and we look into the actual people he's dealing with Michael and Robert Nichols and Quayar and John Nichols all these people who were alive at the time Philip Arthur Thompson BCCI was also collapsing at BCCI the time yeah. and they had this whole yeah. black network of assassins and yep. yeah it's like 
it's a wonder that Danny didn't die. You know, <laughs> and it's like, it's not very far-fetched to think that somebody who's looking into this stuff could die. He's also looking into the Cali cartel's top lawyer. Yeah, it's just like, there's so many people. It's almost and like, it's BCCI like murder on the... also like, being reported on. Like, there's the huge blockbuster story in, it was like, what, Time, Time, Time Magazine. Jonathan you know? Betty. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so it was like, also, Jonathan you know, Betty went into hiding. Yeah, reporters were all over this stuff. Other people, we talked to other reporters who went into hiding after Danny died because they were looking into similar things and they were like, they were getting threats, right? That dude yeah. who was talking to Earl Bryan suddenly mm-hmm. started getting threats and he was like, he was like, yeah, I stopped my investigation right there. He was like, I, I went wow. into, I, I, I drove to the country. I didn't talk to anybody for three months after Danny died. And it's like, you know, it's just like the the sort of official position is like, well, Danny was just kind of like, like a kook. You know, it's like, well, well, I don't know, man. These guys were looking into it and they were scared. Yeah. I'm not saying that, you know, that doesn't like cloud my mind about like, you know, people commit suicide. Absolutely. But, and for all okay, kinds that, of reasons. That is true. But there are also, and this is a point that we've, that gets left out and I think it's important to make. And I'm not an expert on it, but there are leave no trace hitmen. They can go in and kill somebody and get out without leaving any DNA. And it makes it look like a suicide. I mean, that's just a job. People, I'm I'm pretty good at my job. You guys are good at your jobs. And there's people that kill people that are good at their job. Well, and they it's don't just, get it's, caught. It's just also, I mean, you guys go into this. I was really kind of gratified to see that you guys go into, like, the actual uh, talking about the, the suicide, Danny Casalero's death. Uh, and like going to you know the police department and getting the file and stuff like that. And it was one of those things that like has always kind of floated around as this death tape, uh, which I talked to you uh, to, uh, about. We talked about it yesterday. Um, the uh, and it's just like there is like there, there there's some there's that letter that you guys uncover in the composite sketch, which I think is, I mean, frankly, if watch the documentary, they get to it. Um, yeah. It would do it more justice than, than us talking about it right now. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think it's it's far fetched, and, and that is one of those things. It's like, I you really can never, and like it sounds like such a cop out. You can never rule out a suicide or whatever. People do kill themselves, um, but it's also like I think in, in this instance, like there's also a lot of extenuating factors, right? Where like you wouldn't maybe necessarily label something as suicide as quickly as you would if this was just a guy who just gotten fired from his job at like you know whatever the plant and. You know, was deep in debt and had been fighting with his wife. I mean, there's there's extenuating factors at play here. I think um, there's also the idea of like there's such thing in my mind, and and who knows if I'm right about this, but like of driving somebody to the brink of something. Who, uh, uh, you know, of 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 feeling so low and feeling so insane about this stuff. And doing it on purpose because this person is onto something. I mean, that's a little more abstract. Yeah, and maybe well, that's no, like a little it's unfounded. Gaslighting, but or like. Whatever. But but I guess the point of, that I would like to make is, like, just because he, if he did commit suicide, it doesn't mean, like, oh, well, I didn't, like, yeah. he didn't find anything, you know? It's, whatever. it's like, you can be at a really low place when you're trying to look through all this stuff and you're, like, broke and whatever. Like, you can get to a really low place and have stumbled onto some stuff that, that – you can't. Even, it's maybe it's too hard to put together or something, but it doesn't make it un. It doesn't real. delegitimize the the work. But Did also, the suicide is pretty crazy. <laughs> that whole scene. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it's it's also like there's. I would say there's some definite questions about his suicide or whatever. I mean, even FBI agents said they didn't. They said some FBI agents Didn't had think, questions. Yeah, there were so multiple. There was not yeah. full, cons- you know, no, not full consensus, despite what they wanted, what they put out in the report. Yeah, there's I a mean, whole Web Hubble story that we had to leave out. Do you want to tell that? Zach? Oh yeah. Do you know what what Webster? Yeah, Hubble? yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, is, that is like it's sort of like a, just like a, a what was a the speed name of like a Vince Fo- There's a Vince Foster little. <laughs> oh my God! Yeah. So Tony told us this story that didn't make it in. It was like when when Tony met with Janet. So. T- what, two years after Danny's death, all these people are like, oh, DOJ should investigate Danny's death. The DOJ, finally, it's, it's a new regime, right? Yeah. Bush is out, Clinton's in, mm. Janet Reno's now the attorney general. The and, goddess. And so Tony's brought into the, attorney, in the meeting room with the attorney general, Janet Reno. And in there is a, a, a lawyer named Webster Hubble. Um, and he... he is Tony sitting there? He's I mean, assigned I, I, I to be in charge to, like, play of the this clip for people of Tony yeah. telling the story. It's so it's so amazing. He's gonna be he's gonna be in charge of doing the Danny Castellaro investigation, and he says to Tony, 
I know what it's like to lose somebody um, and have it be a question about whether he committed suicide or not. Wow. Because what months, weeks, days earlier, Vince Foster had just been found dead. Yeah. And Webster Hubble sits there and just melts down into tears in this conference room and starts crying. And no one knows what to do. It's Nobody all lawyers. Nobody knows what to do. And Tony, sweetest guy I've ever met, really. Yeah. <laughs> so Hands down. he gets up and he goes over to Webster Hubble and he puts his arm on his, around him and he says, it's okay. Like, it's okay. And it's almost like, you know, you think about like weird sort of psychological stuff going on. It's just like, just, you know, I'm, I, I'm not like a Vince Foster, like, was murdered guy or whatever. I, I have zero well, opinions. Like you haven't certainly. gotten beyond the Wikipedia page. Yeah. I haven't gotten beyond the Wikipedia page. But just that scene, right? And then, and then Webster Hubble, midway through their investigation, is removed. Yeah, because of Whitewater. Because of, like, mm-hmm. his connections with, uh, you know, cr- some criminal stuff with, with his law firm, his old law Rose firm or something law like firm. that. And it's, like, it's just such a D.C. thing. It's like, oh, and now he's in a scandal, and he has to go. And then they get another group in there to do it. You know, it's just, like, such a, such a nightmare for Tony to go through. And then, you know, the end of the report is just, like, and we got the report. We got their notes. We got all this stuff. And it's just... It's not as clear cut as these guys want to make it seem. It's just, it's just not. I think it was a rush job um, to get through it and just be like, yeah, what the Martinsburg police said is pretty much right. Like the, these guys were all kooks, and 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 Danny committed suicide. I'm just like, well, if they were going to go the other way, it would take them ten years. Exactly. Yeah, 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 Christian, not, you know, yeah, not it took longer. Me five, Christian not 10. only that, but the implications would not be good for the government that they work for. You know, especially the DOJ. You know, even even if it, even if Danny. Did kill himself. The stuff that he found out that's, that relates to the DOJ's investigation. You know, something like Philip Arthur Thompson doesn't look great when you have an FBI guy who's an informant who's going around murdering, yeah. raping, selling arms, doing all kinds of stuff with the imprimatur and the help or whatever it is of the FBI and his handlers. It's just not a great look for the, for the Bureau. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's something they battle with for... You know, pretty much yearly. Well, it's mass shooters now, but yeah, yeah. Uh, You know, I wanted to, uh, because we got to wrap up, but I wanted to ask, um, did you guys find yourself going nuts doing this? I had one, recently, one of the pillows from my bed disappeared. It disappeared. (laughs) Like, I looked everywhere. I mean, you ask me any place that it might have been, I looked there. Let me ask you this. Yeah? Did you have a dream you were eating a marshmallow? No, no. I don't like marshmallows. Well, you can still dream about it. Wait, you think you feel like you were literally gaslit? I don't know. I mean, the the only thing that I can think of, well, I don't have a history of sleepwalking. I've never sleepwalked. Oh, I can't say the same. Um, I would have had to, like, lift, like, heavy windows and thrown it into... uh, my street. my street, which I won't say which which one it is, but there's often trash on the street, and I don't mm-hmm. see why the pillow of all things would get you know if I threw it out the window would get you know taken up I mean, the you know all yeah. the other crap that's on the street it still sits there until it gets you know so then um, yeah I don't know it, it was like it was really freaky it was super I mean it's it's a soft uh, literally soft intimidation. But uh, I don't know what it was. Yeah. But my pillow disappeared. And I'm, I just think, like, I, I thought instantly about this story. I heard um, a, a different in, a related investigation um, related to Philip Arthur Thompson. Some people um, surreptitiously recorded the FBI agents that were um, handling him. And um, they got home from San Francisco and they took the tape and they put it in this crawl space under the stairs inside a suitcase in, inside a bag inside a suitcase and put it then when they went out of town the next time and came back they found the tape in their tape player wow and yeah. so so the pillow disappearing was kind of like I don't know maybe someone's like your show's about to come out like I can take your pillow I can take your life just like be good or something I don't know so or maybe I'm insane I don't know what happened to the pillow I, <laughs> it could have been anything but not that many things, actually, because I live alone and I all I that do is work. That was my question. Is it, yeah, is it don't a roommate have named Bushwick who's like, 
taking it for making you do the dish for making them do the dishes. That is it's no, I don't have a room. But like, did you go? Did you like? Did you guys like? I mean, obviously, also like doing a documentary is a ton of work. Like working ten years on something, and you, you've been involved for what seven years? Five or six. Or yeah. It, I mean, it's, since knowing Christian, I've been involved the whole time in some way, just hearing about it. Yeah, we would always talk about it. But you guys but have known each other for a long time. Since we were we kids grew up together in Kentucky. People from Kentucky are crazy. They are crazy. What is that supposed to mean? Well, just, we have a lot out. of experience with people. Liz and I have a ton of experience with people from Kentucky. Really? I'll just put I hope it like it's that. good. It, it's a it's a mixed spectrum. Bag. Mixed it's bag. it's okay. mixed bag. But all, I would say all like of it has people. been has made an impression upon me. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, um, I'll take it. But, uh, but no, but the, the insane. You know, it's just like wh- Brace. What are you getting at? Are you trying to like set up a, <laughs> a, a a sort of like context in which like somebody can say in the future like listen to that Troon on like those guys went insane and, no that's and not what I'm they saying obviously no, but I when do they think fell out of the window that first of all if no, no disrespect of... but if I'm going to kill two guys in their 30s who live in New York I'm going to be like oh they did cocaine laced with fentanyl not okay. saying you guys do cocaine or they get hit by a car on their bike or they get hit by a car on their bike or there was a gas leak or uh, it's a uh, you know there's a variety of things that you can do I think that there's like a f- a f- Fun and a fear. It's like a weird combination of sort of exhilaration that you get from looking into this story mm. that's that's very drug-like, that's very freaky. For somebody like me who's like a, just a wimp, you know, like, yeah, I get freaked out by telling this story. I yeah. get freaked out by talking about it. I like want to knock on wood when I think about the start, conversation we're having right now. I just think it's like really grim and, and kind of fucked up, you know, but you kind of have to talk about it. And yeah, like... Who knows what these people, like, you know, it's an old story, but who knows what people are up to and, like, what little thing you accidentally uncover that, like, you didn't think was a big deal, but to somebody out there who's in the world we're talking about, it's like, it's almost like, we can look at almost like a fictional world, you know, it's like we have characters, we have Robert Rude Nichols, it's always, there's something very abstract, but, like, they're real, you know, and some of them are still alive, and they have friends, and they, you know, it's and a just lot like, of them got arrested for murder, and a lot of them got arrested for murder and other things, you know, and so it's 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 a scary situation. Um, that's that's like you know, I come home, I like to turn on the lights, look around a little bit, and just make sure nobody's in there with me. <laughs> People are so upset when we didn't do the cold open. I know. You know, well, I'm sorry. I'm trying to figure out a way. Look, it's just A-B testing. Sometimes, you, sometimes here's the thing. Yeah, listeners. We just didn't this do is, <laughs> At this the point, listeners, this is like three episodes ago, so you probably don't even remember. But sometimes you're just trying different stuff out, okay? You're just trying different stuff out. We're growing up in public here at True. Enough. Yeah. Hey, give us the space. To experiment. I'm the world's youngest 34-year-old teenager. <laughs> no, preteen. What? I'm a 34-year-old preteen. I'm just a little baby. Oh, God. I'm just a little baby. Oh, no. Here we nope, go. Nope, nope. Reeling that one back in. Um, I am just a little... I am the world's oldest baby. <laughs> uh, and my name... I would say, watch the damn documentary. I used to call Fantastic. this boss I had that I hated, King Baby. King Baby. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. Um, he uh, was King Baby. I uh, I was gratified to hear a shout out to Hercules California. In this. Yeah, that was cool. That was, we love Hercules. I got to look up that weird Hungarian school. Yeah, never heard of that before. But it's also like such a common thing with like like post war uh, or especially like post fifties and, and post fifties really like all of these like Eastern European religious groups being used as like mm. kind of conduits for, for intelligence. I mean, there's so much of that yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's maybe something to look into for another time. With that being said, I am so hungry. I got to eat a little piece of food. My name, but just a little bit. Uh, I'm trying to lose weight. I'm trying to get into spring shape. Uh, because I am planning to do, and I didn't want to announce this right now, but I feel like I have to. I'm planning to do this job completely naked from now on. Okay. Um, with a little sarong on, but so that's not completely naked, but I'm planning on doing this job in a sarong. My name is Brace. I'm Liz. We are, of course, joined by producer Young Chomsky, and this has been True and On. We'll see you next time. Bye bye. <laughs>